Hey guys, what's going on? It's Dave with Evil Eye Games. Today we're going to continue on with the eighth video in our series on creating a third person cover shooter. Now, in the previous video, we had given our player a weapon. Now we're going to want that weapon to actually do something. So, the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to add an input to fire the weapon. So, we're going to go up to Edit, Project Settings. And then we're going to go into our input. We're going to add another action mapping. And I'm going to call this one fire button. And I'm going to assign the fire button to the left mouse button. And we're done with the input right now. But one other thing I'd like to do while we're in the project settings is address some collision. So under engine, we're going to go to collision. And there are object channels and trace channels here. And if you're not really familiar with object channels or trace channels, the object channels basically handle what happens when two items collide in the world. And then the trace channels are for drawing different types of traces in the world. So first we're going to click on the new object channel button. And I'm going to call this weapon channel. And we want the default response to be block. So I'll hit accept. And then we're going to click on the new trace channel button. And we're going to call this weapon trace. And once again, we want the default response to be block. And we're going to hit accept. And then I'm going to hit the little arrow next to preset here to drop this down. And these are all the default responses for the different collision settings. And we're going to want to add in a new preset. And I'm going to call this cover box. We want uh, collision enabled to be set to query only. Object type is finite world static. For the description, we'll just put in cover box collision settings. And then for the default collision response up at the top here, I'm going to set this to overlap. And it's going to set all of the different collision responses to overlap. For all of the traces, we want these to be set to ignore. And at the bottom here, the weapon channel that we just created, we also want this to be set to ignore. And I'm going to go ahead and hit accept. And I'm going to delve into this cover box preset later when I have a tangible example to show you guys. But for now, we're just gonna leave that as is. So we're gonna close out of our project settings. And the next thing we're gonna to have to address is firing our actual weapon. Now we're gonna have a input that we just created, but we want to think about first how this is going to function. The weapon is held by the character, so the character is gonna to have to pass through an instruction to the weapon to tell it to fire. And the input, if we're consistent, is going to be in the player controller. So we're gonna to wanna to pass information from the player controller down to the player character. I'm gonna actually do all of this in reverse and I'm gonna work backwards up to the player controller. So the first thing we're gonna do is go into our weapons folder, into our player weapons, and we're gonna open up our base weapon blueprint. And we're going to want to create two custom events. So I'm going to type in custom event and we'll click on add custom event. I'm going to call this one fire weapon. And I create a second custom event. And I'm going to call this one stop fire weapon. So this will give us controls to fire the weapon and stop firing the weapon. Now the assault rifle, uh, the first weapon I'm going to be dealing with, is going to be a fully automatic weapon. So the way it's going to be set up is when the player presses down the mouse button, it's going to start firing the weapon, and when they release, it's going to stop firing the weapon, henceforth why we need two events. Now all the weapons are not going to take advantage of this. For something like a shotgun or a pistol, you're only going to want to fire the weapon once every time you press the button. You're not going to want it to continually fire when you hold the button down. So 
they won't all necessarily be using these events, but we want to have it available in the event that the weapon does use it. So we'll go ahead and compile and save. Back in our main window here, I am going to go into our player character, and we're going to open up our player character. And the first thing to notice here is when we spawned our weapon, the spawn actor returns a value of actor, or a type of variable that is an actor. Now we want to be able to access the functions within our base weapon. So I'm actually going to drag this attach to component and mesh over to the side here. And our equip weapon over to the side here. And I'm going to select our equipped weapon variable. And for variable type right now, it's just set as actor. We want this to be our base weapon. So I'm going to type in here and search for base weapon. And we'll find our base weapon blueprint. And we want to select reference. It's going to throw up this change variable type error message. And we're going to click on change variable type. And the first thing you'll notice is it breaks the link between the spawn actor and the equipped weapon. And if you try to connect them together, it says it's not the same type of reference. So from spawn actor, we're going to have to drag off the return value. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to cast to our base weapon blueprint. And we're going to connect that into our spawn actor. And from the as base weapon blueprint, we're going to connect that to our equipped weapon and the execution pin to our set variable. So now when we use the equipped weapon variable, we will be able to call on functions that exist within the base weapon blueprint. So we're going to go down to the bottom here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to add in a new custom event. And we're going to do the same thing that we did in the weapon. We're going to create a fire weapon custom event and we're going to create a stop fire event as well and what we want these events to do is we're going to drag out our equipped weapon variable and we're going to get it and from our equipped weapon, we want to call on those events in our base weapon. So we're going to search for fire weapon. And then we're going to drag off it again and search for stop fire weapon. And then we're going to connect our execution pins from the fire weapon to fire weapon and stop fire weapon to stop fire weapon. I'm going to put a comment box around this. And we'll just call it the fire weapon. So we're going to head and compile and save. And lastly, we're going to go into our player controller. We're going to right click and we put that fire button input action in. So we're going to search for the fire button. And from our fire button here, we're going to want to call those events that are in our character. So we're going to drag out our player character reference and we're going to get it. From here, we're going to search for the fire weapon. And we're also going to search for the stop fire weapon. And we're going to connect the firing of the weapon to the pressed and the stop to the released. So around this, I'm going to put a comment box and we're going to call this fire button. So we now have it set up so that when we press our fire button, it sends a signal to our player character. When it gets to our player character, it sends a signal to our weapon that we're equipped. And the weapon that we're equipped, we're now going to have to set the action that the weapon is going to take at this point. So we're going to create a couple of functions in our base weapon. And then we're going to actually execute them in our child class. 
Reason being is not all the weapons are going to fire the same, but they're going to do the same kind of things. It's just in a different order or a different time span. So what we're going to do is, in our functions, under my blueprint over to the left here, we're going to add a new function. And we're going to call this calculate shoot info. And what this is going to do is we're going to use this to decide where we want to fire our projectile from our weapon to. Now, in order to do this, we're going to actually need a reference to the player camera. Now, the player camera is on the player character itself. So we're going to add in a new function as well. And we're going to call this set camera. And we're going to want an input for this. So under inputs, I'll click on new. I'm going to call this input camera. And then for variable type, we're going to search for camera component. We're going to mouse over camera component and we're going to select a reference. And then from our set camera variable here, we're going to promote to a variable. And we're going to call this variable player camera. So basically all it's going to do is set the player camera. We compile this and save this. I'm going to go back to the player character. And at the point where we create our weapon and then attach it, after this we want to set our camera within the weapon so that it has a reference to it. So from the equipped weapon here, or even the as base weapon blueprint here, we can drag off, and we're going to call that function set camera. I'm just going to add in a couple of pins here. We're going to connect this up at the end of attach actor to component, and then we need a reference for the camera. So under our components tab to the left here, I'm going to drag out our camera reference. And I'm going to plug that into our camera input. So when we spawn our weapon, we're creating reference to it, we're attaching it to our character, and then we're setting the camera variable within our weapon so that it has a reference to our player's camera. So I'll go ahead and compile and save. We'll go back to our base weapon blueprint and we can close out the set camera function. So now we're going to calculate the shooting information on where we want our weapon to fire its projectile to. So I'm going to click on the function and I'm going to add a new output. And this new output is going to be a transform on where we want to shoot our projectile. So I'm going to call this output shoot to location. And then for the variable type, we're going to select transform. And I'm going to drag this off a bit. Now, if we drag from the shoot to location and we want to make a transform, we're going to see the information that we're going to need to provide to the return node. So we're going to need a location and we're going to need a rotation. The scale can remain at one across the board. So we don't need to worry about that. Now we have to figure out where our camera is pointing and the direction it's pointing in. So we're going to drag out our player camera reference. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the location of our camera. And we want to get world location. Then we're going to drag out from our player camera again. And we are going to get the forward vector. And this is going to provide a vector that describes the direction that the camera is pointing in. But this forward vector is normalized, which basically means that it's a length of one, which is in the world one centimeter. And we want the weapon to fire to a point that's much, much further beyond that. So from the return value of our get forward vector, I'm going to drag off and I'm going to find a multiplier. 
and we're going to select the vector times a float. Now in this float value here, I'm going to make this 10,000. So what this is going to do is it's going to take a one centimeter vector length and it's going to multiply it by 10,000. So it's, you're going to have a 10,000 centimeter forward vector. And this forward vector, you can change the length of this value. So if you have like an open world game where the area is going to be much, much bigger, you can make this variable much, much larger. But for the case of what I'm doing here, I don't really need much more than 10,000 centimeters long, which is 100 meters. And then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to drag off of our get world location and we're going to want to search for add and we want to add a vector plus a vector and we're going to add the result of our forward vector multiplication to the add and what we're doing here is we're taking the world location of the camera and there we're adding 10,000 centimeters in the direction that the camera is pointing to or 100 meters. It probably is a lot easier to refer to it in meters than it is in centimeters, but I know it can be a little confusing because you have a value of 10,000 here, and you would think that the default measurement in Unreal is a meter, but it's really one centimeter. So what are we gonna to wanna to do with this information? I'm gonna drag off of calculate shoot information here, and we're gonna perform a line trace. So we'll search for line trace, and we want to select line trace by channel. And this is going to basically draw a line between the start and the end, and then anything that interrupts it that's set to react to the channel, it will return if it hits something. Now you remember earlier we created a line trace channel called weapon. So we're going to want to use that. So under trace channel here, we're going to select our weapon trace. The start point is going to be the location of the camera. So from the get world location of our player camera, we're going to plug that into our start. And the end is going to be the result of the addition here. And then for testing purposes, there is this draw debug type. And in order to test this, we're going to set this for duration. And what the draw debug type is going to do is it's actually going to draw a line in a world so we can see what the line trace is actually doing. So after our line trace by channel here, I'm gonna drag off and we're gonna add in a branch. Now the line trace by channel returns two things. It returns this out hit, which is the information that it collects on whatever it ends up running to when it runs this line trace. And there's a return value that returns whether or not it actually hit something. So we're going to drag this return value into our branch. And we're going to need to do something if it hits something and if it doesn't hit something. So the, in the event that it hits something, we're going to drag from our out hit. And we are going to go ahead and break the hit result. And this will give us all the information of whatever it ended up hitting. So the transform that we're gonna to wanna to end up producing, we want our start location to be from the weapon mesh muzzle itself. So we're gonna drag out from our weapon mesh here. We're going to go ahead and get socket location. And in this particular case, I know that the tip of the barrel has a socket already in place called muzzle with a capital M. So I'm gonna go ahead and type that in. And once again, to reiterate, whenever using sockets, this has to be absolutely identical to the name of the socket. It's case sensitive and it has to be spelled correctly. If you don't do that, it's not gonna work right. So for our make transform here, we're going to go ahead and drag the return value into the location for our make transform. So we have a start point at which the projectile is going to start. Now we have to figure out the rotation. So in order to figure out the rotation, we're going to drag off of our get socket location and we are going to search for look at rotation. And we'll find this function in here called find look at rotation. 
And the start is going to be from our muzzle. And we want the look at rotation to be the impact point of where our line trace hit. So this will give us a rotation that looks at from the muzzle to where our line trace hit. And we're going to drag this result into the rotation. And once again, we don't really need the scale, so we're going to leave that be. And the next thing we need to deal with is what happens if our line trace doesn't hit anything. So if we shoot up into the air, it's going to trace out 100 meters. And if there's nothing up there, what's it going to do then? So I'm going to take this return node, and I'm going to duplicate it. And we're going to connect the false down to this second return node. And what we want to do now is we want to shoot at basically where the line trace ended. So I'm going to copy this find look at rotation. And we're going to connect our get socket location for our muzzle to it. But for our target here, we want to find out where we were originally shooting at. So this original endpoint here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drag off of our addition, and we're going to connect this into the target. And I will add a couple of rewrote nodes in here to make it look nice and make it easier to read. So this, in the event that we don't actually find something to hit, we will still be able to return a transform as to where the projectile is going to be going. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to copy this transform down here. We're going to plug in a return value to our return node. The return value for our find look at rotation is going to go to our rotation. And the location is going to remain the same for the start point. So we're going to grab our socket location, drag it down here. And we'll just tidy things up a little bit. So at this point, we'll go ahead and compile and save. And then we're going to go into our main browser window. We're going to go into the content browser. We're going to open up player weapons. And we're going to open up our assault rifle blueprint. Now, being the first time we're opening this, you're going to want to click at the top here where it says Open Full Blueprint Editor. And we're going to want to call on those functions in our base weapon. So we're going to right click in the graph. And we're going to search for the fire weapon. And we want to add event fire weapon, not call the function. And then we want to right click and we want to find the stop fire weapon event. Now, the relationship between parents and children mean that the children have anything that the parents have, but the children won't necessarily execute what the parent has unless you tell it to. So in the event of these weapon, event weapon fire and event stop fire weapon, actually overriding the base weapons events. And if we want these weapons to do whatever the base weapon does and then apply something more to it, what we can do is we can click on the event fire weapon. And if we right click, there is an add call to parent function and it'll produce this orange, what looks like a simple pass-through execution function. And what this is doing, if you connect it up, is when the event fire weapon occurs, it's going to first perform anything that is in the parent class for the fire weapon event. 
So we're gonna do the same thing with the event stop fire weapon. We're gonna do right click and add call to parent function. And we're gonna go ahead and plug that in. So anytime these two events fire here in the base weapon on our event graph, it's gonna call whatever is plugged into these. So in our assault rifle, we have it set up so that the fire weapon occurs and then it does whatever the parent says it's going to do. And the first thing we're going to want to do when we hit the fire button is we're gonna drag off from here and we're going to go ahead and search for play animation. And it is automatically going to select our weapon mesh for it, add the variable in. Uh, if you wanna get this reference to the weapon mesh, you can also come up to the components tab and drag the weapon mesh into the event graph. And we're gonna to have to select an animation to play. And we're going to search for fire and we have a fire rifle w animation sequence and this is the animation sequence for the rifle to fire the weapon um, if you're using your own custom static meshes and you don't have animations programmed up with it and you don't want to make animations what you can do in lieu of this is you can end up uh, spawning a particle or an emitter at location. Um, you can then use the emitter for the effect of the muzzle flash here and plug that in. Uh, you can plug in the lo location of the barrel and then you can set the rotation as facing away from the barrel. And then as well as that, you would end up having to play a sound And for weapon effects that or any of the sound effects that occur on the character, personally, I prefer to use the 2D sound instead of playing at a location. Uh, depending on the sound, if the sound lasts for a certain period of time um, and your character is moving, the sound will stay in the same location as it's playing. It won't necessarily travel with the character. However, there is this spawn sound attached as well. And you can attach a sound to a component of the mesh. But personally, I feel that the sound quality is better just playing the 2D sound. And you can select the sound asset and have it play the sound of the weapon firing at this point. So I'm going to get rid of these because the animation that we have for our weapon mesh has the sound and the particle effect built in. And once we play the animation, we then want to call on our function that we created, which is calculate shoot info. And this is gonna return a shoot to location, like we set up in the function itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna compile all of this. And in our test map here, um, first I'm just gonna hit save all. I'm going to hit play and we're going to test this out. So if we go ahead and hit our trigger, you'll see that it is drawing that visible line trace that we had earlier from our camera to where our camera is pointing. And it should be hitting right in the middle of the screen, which it looks like it is actually doing. And earlier we had messed around with the presets and I didn't really go into it. When we fire our weapon, at our cover box here. We know that there's this invisible box right here next to this object. If we fire at that invisible box, we see that that little red dot there, that indicates that it triggers a hit and it's saying that something is there. And for our weapon traces and our projectiles, we don't want it to do that. We want it to basically ignore these collision boxes that exist. So we're going to escape out of here and we're going to go into our maps folder. We're going to open our common objects and I'm going to open up the base cover object here. If we select the cover box one, which is the first collision box we have, um, to the right in the details pane under collision, you'll notice that there's these collision presets here 
and it's natively set to overlap all dynamic. Now we don't want it to block our weapon channel or our trace channel. And we created that cover box preset. So I'm going to select the drop down and select cover box and it will load up the settings for the cover box that we created in the presets. Now we're going to have to repeat this process for all of the collision boxes that exist here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for the end of cover boxes as well as the main cover boxes themselves. And I'm going to go ahead and compile and save. And we hit play to test this out. If I fire at those collision boxes, you'll notice now it's completely ignoring the line trace. So it's not returning any hits on those collision boxes. Now one thing you may also notice, I've already corrected this issue, but you may see the flash cone coming off the animation of this weapon facing in one direction. So we're going to go into the sci-fi weapon light, we're going to go into the FX, we're going to go into the particles folder, and you'll see that there's this assault rifle muzzle flash light. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And I believe it's under the core mesh here. Yes, it is. So this core mesh here is the cone-shaped flash that comes off the end of the muzzle flash. And if we click on required here, by default, under emitter to the left here, use local space is unchecked for some reason. You're going to want to check that. Because probably what you're going to end up seeing, if I uncheck this, I hit save and I hit play, more than likely you're going to be seeing this where the muzzle flash rotates with, or correction, doesn't rotate with the character. And we don't want that to happen, we want it to be, always be firing in the direction that the rifle is facing. So you want to make sure that under core mesh here, the use local space is checked, save it, and one thing to note is you're going to have to do this for all of the muzzle flashes in the package. So you're going to have to do it for, like in the sniper rifle, if you end up using a sniper rifle, you're going to have to go in under core mesh, click on required, and use local space. Check it so it's true, and save, and then repeat for all of the muzzle flashes that exist in here. All right, so now that we know that our weapon trace is working properly, and we have a point to which we want to fire a projectile, we're going to have to actually cause that projectile to fire. So we're going to have to go into our weapons folder first, and we're going to right click, and I'm going to create a new folder, and I'm going to call this projectiles. We're going to open up this folder, and inside the projectile folder I'm going to right click, and we're going to create a new blueprint class, and we're going to create a actor class. And I'm going to call this Base projectile underscore BP. And just like with the weapons, I am going to go ahead and create one main instance or one main projectile actor and then create subsequent child classes for each different type of weapon. So I'm going to double click and open up this base projectile BP. And the first thing we want to do is we're going to add a couple of components to our actor. So under the components tab here, I'm going to click on add component and we want to add a collision sphere. So if we search for collision, there is a sphere collision. I'm going to select that and we can call this bullet. And I'm going to drag this bullet on top of default scene root. So it's going to make this collision sphere the root of our projectile. Next, I'm going to add another component. This is going to be a particle mesh or a particle system. So if we search for particle, we see particle system. I'm going to click on that. And lastly, I'm going to add a component called a projectile movement. And this is going to describe how the projectile is going to move. Now, we're going to need to set up the parameters for each one of these. 
So first I'm going to start out with our collision sphere, the bullet. And we're going to go down to the details panel on the right here. First off, there is a sphere radius. The default is set to 32, which is 32 centimeters, which is a pretty big bullet, more like a cannonball. So I'm going to change the setting on this to 1. So it's going to be a 1 centimeter collision object or a 1 centimeter bullet. And the other thing we wanted to do is if we travel down the menu here, uh, we're going to see the option under physics for linear dampening. And what this does is it basically creates a drag effect on our projectile. So as it travels through the environment, it'll experience drag and it'll get slowed down over time. Now the weapon I'm trying to create is kind of like a, a Star Wars blaster. And there's not really going to be any noticeable slowing down of the projectile as it travels. So I'm going to actually set this to zero. Now you can play with this linear dampening. So if you have like a more physical object like a grenade or an arrow, you're going to want to play around with this linear dampening and set it to different values because obviously an arrow is going to fly in an arc and as it travels it's going to slow down. Or if you want a more realistic bullet, you can play with the linear dampening so it'll slow down over time. And lastly, for the enable gravity, I'm going to set this to false. Once again, because I want a blaster laser type weapon, it's not really going to be affected by gravity at all. Under collision here, we have simulation generates hit event. We want that to be marked as true. And then for our collision presets here, we're going to, from the drop down, select custom. And we want query only, no physics collision. Uh, world dynamic object type is fine. And then we want to set the default reaction to block. But we don't want our bullet to react with any of the traces. So I'm going to set the visibility camera and weapon trace to ignore. And we don't want it to interact with other bullets in the environment. So for weapon channel, I'm going to set this to ignore. And we're going to be done in our collision sphere. The next thing we want to go to is our particle system. And to the right underneath particles here, for a template, we're going to want to search for tracer. And there's an assault rifle tracer light. So I'm going to select that. You're going to notice that the particle system is going to be very large relative to the size of our actual collision sphere. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to scale the particle system down to about 0.5. And then I want to move it so that the tip of the particle system envelops our collision sphere. Now, if you're adjusting it and the particle system switches off, under emitter actions over here, you can click on reset emitter, and that will start the particle emitter again. So once we have our particle system adjusted, we're going to go into our projectile movement. And this is going to help us describe how the projectile will move through our environment. So the first thing we're going to want to play with here is under projectile, there's the initial speed. I'm going to set this to a default value of 5,000. And this is going to dictate how fast this particle moves when it's created. The next thing I want to change is there's the projectile gravity scale. I want to set this to zero. And what this does is it sets the, or how much gravity affects the projectile as it travels. And you can change this up with different particles or different projectiles so that they fall faster or fall slower. Or in this case, if we set it to zero, it will not fall at all. And we're going to go ahead and compile and save. And then we want to set up what happens when this projectile actually hits something. So we're going to go into our event graph here. And I'm going to click on our bullet or our sphere collision. I'm going to right click and we're going to add event. And we're going to add on component hit. And what this is going to do is when that collision sphere runs into something that it reacts with, it's going to fire this event. 
And when this projectile hits something, we want it to play a particle system that reflects it actually hitting something. So we're going to want to drag off of our uncomponent hit. We're going to want to spawn emitter at location. Now in order to get the location for this, we're going to have to use the hit information that's returned from our on component hit. So we're going to drag off from this and we're going to break the hit result. And we want this to spawn at the impact point. So from impact point here, we're going to drag this up to location. And then for the rotation, the emitters that we're going to be using are designed to come back at where they're fired from. So what we can basically do is get our rotation. So we'll get actor rotation here, and we can plug this value into rotation. And then we have an emitter template here. So if we set down here, and we search for impact, there'll be small, medium, and large impacts, both dark and light. So our assault rifle is using the light particle systems. And I'm going to use a impact metal medium light. And it's going to spawn this emitter when it ends up colliding with something. We want to go ahead and promote this to a variable. And I'm going to call this variable impact effect. So when we create subsequent child classes, we can set this impact effect variable differently. So different weapons can have different impact effects when they hit something. And the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to destroy our projectile, at least for now. So from spawn emitter at location, we're going to go ahead and find destroy actor. And we're going to want to destroy this blueprint so it's self. So what's going to happen is we're going to fire out this projectile. It's going to travel until it hits something. When it runs into something, it's going to spawn our emitter at the location. And then it's going to destroy the actor. And then uh, one other thing is we might want to play a sound at the location. So after spawn emitter at location, I'm going to drag off. And we're going to search for play sound at location. And if we search in here, I'm going to look for impact. And we're going to see in here there's a bunch of impact sounds that come with the weapons package. So I'm going to search for impact Q. And we have the rifle impact surface Q. I'm going to use that sound Q. And then once again, we're going to want to promote this to a variable because we're going to want to be able to change it based on the weapon. And we're going to call this impact sound. And of course, I misspelled it. So there we go. So now we're going to spawn an emitter at the location. We're going to play an impact sound. And then we're going to destroy ourselves. Now the other thing to take into consideration here is if we have an open environment where we fire up into the air or we fire off in a direction where there's nothing where it's going to eventually hit, our projectile is just going to be there and it's going to keep traveling and keep traveling and keep traveling and it's never going to get destroyed. We want to prevent that from happening because as you're running around the game, if you start firing off a whole ton of these projectiles into the air it's going to load up and clog up the memory of the system running it because, you know, you can get to the point where you have 10,000 of these projectiles flying around and it constantly has to calculate their direction and their physical travel. So I'm going to drag off from event begin play here and we're going to search for set lifespan. And what this is going to do is it's going to set in seconds the maximum time that this projectile can exist in the world. 
So once it hits that certain time frame, it's then going to destroy itself. So in lifespan here, I'm going to set this for 10. So that'll give us 10 seconds for the projectile to travel and hit something. Once again, if you're in a larger open world, you might want to extend this lifespan. But for my purposes, I think this is going to be plenty of time. So next, we're going to go back to our main window here. And I'm going to right click on our base projectile blueprint. And we're going to go ahead and create a child blueprint. And we're going to call this Assault Rifle Projectile underscore BP. And we'll go ahead and save all. And if we open up this Assault Rifle Projectile BP, you'll notice it has everything that we set up with it before. Now I used all the defaults for what we want to use for our Assault Rifle, so it's convenient, and also so we had a baseline for everything. So next we're going to want to go to our Assault Rifle Blueprint. And we have our Calculate Shoot information. We want to now spawn our projectile. So we're going to drag you off of the Calculate Shoot info. And we're going to spawn Actor from Class. And this will have the input for the transform here. So we can connect our shoot to location to our spawn transform. And then for the class here, we can search for our assault rifle projectile blueprint. Now, once again, because this is going to change from weapon to weapon, I want to make this into a variable so we can plug it in and then we can set the defaults for each weapon. So we're going to go ahead and go back to our base weapon blueprint. We're going to add a new variable and we're going to call this variable projectile class. And for the variable type, we're going to search for actor and we want an actor class. So we're going to go ahead and compile and save. And then for projectile class down here, we can actually set this to our. Assault Rifle Projectile Blueprint as the default. So we'll go ahead and compile and save. So back in our Assault Rifle Blueprint here, uh, we're going to right click and we're going to get Projectile Class. And that'll give us the variable for the projectile class that we set up. And we can go ahead and plug it into our spawn actor. So I'm going to go ahead and compile and save. At this point, when we fire the weapon, we are playing the animation on our weapon mesh. We're calculating where we want to shoot to, and we're providing that shoot to location to a spawn actor, and it's going to spawn our projectile, and it's going to assign it a transform, which is going to provide it with the direction and the location as to where it's spawning. And lastly, we want to, under Collision Handling Override here, we want to set it to Always Spawn and Ignore Collisions. So let's go ahead and compile and save. And we'll hit Play. Now if we fire the weapon, you'll see that the projectile is traveling from the barrel of the weapon to where we're looking at. And it's meeting that hit location in the world. Now, it looks a little bit odd right now because the way the character is carrying the weapon. Um, so I'm just going to make a minor adjustment to our character's camera. So I'm going to go into our player character and I'm going to go into the spring arm. And the socket offset right now is set to 50. So that would adjust the left and the right. But I'm going to set it in the Z scale to another 50. We'll compile and save. And that looks a little bit high. So we're going to make it 20. And that looks a lot better to me. 
And we're going to definitely play with this down the road a little bit. And you see now that when we fire the weapon, it travels from the barrel to where we're pointing the camera. And then there's a little explosion effect that occurs when it impacts. So that's going to conclude today's video. In the next video, we're going to go about dealing damage to an enemy. So if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, go ahead and leave them down below. And thanks for watching.